I don't understand that space. I'm not a coder. Even though I play video games, I don't know how they're made. I don't know why they, they're made the way that they're made. I don't know how people are going to react to them, but the people that are doing it do. And I have to trust in them in the same way someone would trust in me. If they gave me a story to write and I wrote it for them, they would have to understand that I understand my medium and I know how to communicate through it. And I think that it, that part was a little unnerving in the beginning, yeah. but once you realize that they're playing by generic rules that you've helped set for them, and you're going to see your characters come to life in a different way, it would almost be the same thing if you saw it in a movie, right? Melting Pot, a global podcast series hosted by Pyle, connects guests who have inspiring stories and reaches out to a multicultural audience over 52 countries. Guests are diverse, such as celebrities, entrepreneurs, travelers, and many more who've had a turning point in their lives and moved over to a holistic lifestyle. Follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, social media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Melting Pot episode. My guest today is Joe. Hilliard. He has taken the world of epic fantasy and dark fantasy completely by storm. He is the brilliant mind behind the Warminster Saga, which is a captivating four-part book series that has quickly gained acclaim with the first two of the books, The Last Keeper and The Vorodin's Lair, becoming Amazon's bestsellers. And as I understand, we are eagerly awaiting the release of the fourth installment in quarter three of 2024. And I think that his imaginative world building and gripping storytelling will continue to enthrall the reader. So thank you so much, Joe, for joining me today. And I have to mention here for the listeners who will not be able to see the background, the people who watch the episode on YouTube will be able to. It's extremely eye-catching. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me today, Joe. It's my pleasure. And, and that was an excellent introduction. I appreciate it. I'm actually humbled by it. Thank you very much. And I can't take credit for the background. That's my <laughs> First book's cover, and that's March Gallagher, who is my illustrator over in the UK. She's been fantastic, and I get a lot of compliments on her work. Yeah, uh, so no, I'll, I'll put yeah. a plug in for her. No, I can see, but it's. I think it's a. Comp it's always a combined effort, right? So the artist and her, and the author and you, and the vision that you have and the way that she's been able to take it forward through the illustration, I think is phenomenal. So can we start by getting a little bit on your background? Yeah, sure. So I, I didn't start out my career as an author. I started out as a defense lobbyist. I was doing a lot of work in Washington, D.C. for the defense and technology communities, primarily around military applications, but sometimes around transportation or energy or healthcare. Uh, and I did that for almost 20 years until COVID. Uh, and then when COVID happened, DC and my line of work was practically shut down for almost a year and a half. And as a result, I always wanted to write a fantasy adventure novel and I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I decided to kick that off the bucket list. And I thought it was going to be a one-off opportunity and I was going to write this and it was going to be out of my blood, but ultimately I shared it with an associate professor friend of mine who thought it was very publishable and ended up connecting me to a development editor who ended up connecting me to my publisher and lo and behold, we're four books into a series and it's just, it's taken on a life of its own and, and I don't ever want to look back. And this is a lot of fun and it's a lot less stress than what I was doing before. And it's, it's the, the community is great to work with. I enjoy working with not just the folks that read the books, but also the folks that I work with around it. Like I mentioned March earlier, but my publisher and my editors, they make something that's difficult fun. Yeah, sometimes you, it happens when you least expect it. And then when it does, you wonder why it did not happen sooner so yeah and it's just been four years and you're already um an amazon 
a bestseller. So I think that speaks volumes of your work. So I wanted to ask you, what is the inspiration behind the saga? And how have you developed its unique blend of epic and dark fantasy elements? How have you included those elements in the book? Sure. So the inspiration for it really comes from me being a lifelong nerd. Uh, I've played Dungeons and Dragons since I was 10. And one of the things that you get out of that game is it's not like a typical board game or even a video game. These are stories that are made up in the heads of the players and you share for what I would describe for lack of a better explanation, a group delusion where the storyteller, in this case, the dungeon master, the one who's leading the campaign tells a story and then you as your characters react to it and you do things and you, you, find clues and you fight monsters and you go on quests and well all of that stuff really feeds well into fantasy adventure noveling right so if i'm writing something there's not much difference than me telling the story or writing the story and with the exception of this is no one's playing this game right it's a linear yeah. experience i'm taking you on a novel trip as you read through it and it was i think knitting together all of those years of gameplay with great stories that have all been game tested and that have won out in many of my friends is like you can tell when you're playing the game when you're when everyone's having a lot of fun and then you know that that's the kind of entertainment you want to put in the novel so you take the best of the best yeah. and i've been able to do that over the years now of course i don't have permission to use dungeons and dragons yeah. system so i created my own world like you mentioned before and so what i've done is i've taken instead of it being Middle Earth for Tolkien or, or Westeros for Game of Thrones, I created Warminster and all good sci-fi and fantasy authors have to create their own world anyway. Yeah. Uh, and you base some of it on some form of realism, but for the most part, I founded my own magic system. I have my own pantheon of gods. I've got my own currency, the own royalty, own governance uh, as part of it. And I think that makes it interesting. And I've been able to take those epic and high fantasy tropes that a lot of my readership want to see and that I've spun them up with a little bit of a gothic a more darker feel to them so when you read it the good guys don't always win and there's you often will see through the eyes of the villain as opposed to only seeing through the eyes of the protagonists or the heroes and I think that adds a lot to it and I think part of that just came from the fact that I've been a a long time fan of Bram Stoker and Dracula, or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And you, you go back and you read these like darker novels yeah. that at the time were very edgy. And those are the things that scared me as a kid. And they frankly scare me today. Like those, if you want to read a horror novel, those things are there. And I think adding that sort of compliment to epic fantasy, I think my readers find that it's different than what the majority of it is on the market today. And it, I think it makes me stand out within a crowded marketplace. So now your fourth book in the series, I know that, like I mentioned, it's getting launched in the third quarter of this year without giving any spoiler. Can you give us a little glimpse on what the readers uh, should expect? From the fourth book? Yeah, so this spoilers. is the no epic spoilers. ending to the... Ep no, I won't spoil it. <laughs> this is the epic ending to an epic fantasy series. And so you can expect a lot of action. There's going to be a lot of battles. And you'll see a lot of the storylines woven together here at the end to provide the end to the stories for a lot of the main characters. And in, in many fantasy or sci-fi books, it's typical to have multi-point of view characters throughout. And so there are a number of characters that the reader will see through the eyes of uh, and I'm, I'm gonna say be prepared uh, not everybody <laughs> makes it I won't leave it at that but it's it's literally action-packed from beginning to end so if you like harrowing adventure and you like individual duels or big battle scenes or magic spell in and, and monsters and and stuff you're really really gonna love this one because that's it literally it's hard to put down because every chapter is another battle right? and there's only I think out of the 30 or so chapters, I think there's only three that there's not a battle scene in. Wow. Uh, which is, <laughs> yeah. But hey, that's what this is for. And, and it was supposed to be a trilogy based on the response we had gotten from the first couple of books. We decided to break the third one into two. And I think that we did the right thing. And folks are really enjoying the fact that there's a fourth book here. And then there's more to come. 
but ultimately Echoes of Ghostwood will be out here this month later on right. uh, by the end of, of August and, and readers will be able to pick it up as an individual or through a box set. So I'm looking forward to, to getting that out. I got my first first convention this coming weekend here in my own home city and uh, I get a chance to, to go out there and talk about that stuff too and, and see a lot of friends that have been asking me about it. So I'm, I'm excited. Wow. Yeah. And we're excited for you as well. And I understand that your series is being now, If I'm not sure if you can talk about it, but if you can, I'd love you to give us a little more insight into it. Uh, your series is being adapted into an AR, VR, melded reality game. Is that correct? That is. So in 2026, the augmented reality and virtual reality game for the Realm of Warminster will come out and it'll feature a lot of the same characters that you'll see, but it will be uh, allowing you to create your own avatar and play in the game. And you don't have to follow along the plot line, but knowing the plot line will help you on some of the quests that are offered. So your characters can level up and yeah, I'm excited about that. It's been interesting because I haven't, I didn't know what that was going to be like. And when I licensed the IP, I've been relegated to the sideline. A lot of that is me just helping them storyboard it. And what's been fun about it is that you see your product taking a life through someone else's eyes, right? And they know their medium better than I know their medium. And so I, I'm just there to help and create guardrails for them to stay inside. And theirs is a challenging task, right? They've got a, because as, as a video game player, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to follow the storyline. You can side with the villains if you want to and, and things like that. So it's not where I've got a very point A to point B, this is where the story is going. They've got to, they've got to really be open-minded to how players are going to play. And so they're really setting the, the world a life within the augmented reality and then eventually virtual reality will come out the year after those two game settings i'm just excited about it it's gonna be a lot of fun but how do you feel about like you mentioned that you're not really it's your material you're not really involved in a sense of the, the process of developing it so how do you feel about the story not really it's yours but there's going to be so many different variations to it does that bother you? Or I know you're excited because obviously you're going to see it in a different format, but does that bother you in any way? Because it's your content. I did for about two weeks and then you get over it. <laughs> and part of it is, you're right, it's your baby and right. you want it to look the way you want it to look. And then you realize in order for it to find a broader audience, yeah. it takes a different form. And in this form, it's a new medium. Uh, and as a result, I don't understand that space. I'm not a coder. Even though I play video games, I don't know how they're made. I don't know why they, they're made the way that they're made. I don't know how people are going to react to them, but the people that are doing it do. And I have to trust in them in the same way someone would trust in me. If they gave me a story to write and I wrote it for them, they would have been understand that I understand my medium and I know how to communicate through it. And I think that it, that part was a little unnerving in the beginning. Yeah. But once you realize that they're playing by generic rules that you've helped set for them and you're going to see your characters come to life in a different way it would almost be the same thing if you saw it in a movie right you might not always see the same the right people cast for the right roles but if they're good actors and actresses then it won't matter you'll forget that 10 minutes into the movie and just enjoy yourself yeah. and that's what i've got to, in the beginning i was nervous but now i'm just letting it go i'm just and there to help you're letting <laughs> the process take a life of its own which is good yeah which that's is right. good yeah, now I understand you also have a magazine called the Altered Reality Magazine. And yeah, so I so what's that? Go ahead. So I bought this magazine from I, I used to write into it. I was a submitter to it. And there was a woman who started it about a decade ago and a few years back she was unable to keep it going. And she asked me as one of her writers, but also someone that was business savvy to take a look at it and see if it was something that I could help to transform and really help keep it going. And the magazine's done really well. And Altered Reality is a, for speculative fiction writers and speculative poetry writers. So write in sci-fi or fantasy or dystopian novels or the Gothic or horror, or you write about monsters and things like that. If you wanna write it in poetry, you wanna write it in fiction, you submit it to us. And if it, it's good enough, we will publish it for you. And so sometimes 
this magazine is the first portal of publication for many first time authors. And those novice authors come to us and we help them you know, go through the editing processes and understand what it needs to, to be before it does get published. And then if they agree, we go ahead and publish it. But we also have award-winning authors, people that have won awards and other kind of other like really big awards. And so you've got some recognizable names that you'll see on occasion drop something in the magazine all the way down to new authors and new poets that come to us for the first time. And we try to memorialize everything on the site. So even though you, someone might have submitted something 10 years ago, you can still find it. We get about 180,000 visitors a year to it. So it's a well-visited site uh, and we don't charge anybody anything for it. So it's, we don't pay our authors. They don't pay us to, to be on the site. We have a couple of sponsors that help us offset the cost of the site and that's it. And it's really for the love of site. It's really, it's there to help and give back to the community. And so those that are interested in checking it out, alteredreality.com is the place to go. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, are you seeing or noticing any trends or any changes in speculative fiction and the poetry submissions that you're getting? Is there, has it evolved over the years since you got the magazine and you were writing for it anyways? Um, what kind of trends are you seeing now? Are you noticing now? I think the biggest change in the marketplace is the length of the submissions. I think generationally, there's been a challenge of time. And so longer submissions are less read than the shorter submissions. And I think you've seen that on with Amazon launching Vela, Kindle Vela. I think you that a lot. And part of it is the millennials and Gen Zers just don't have the attention span for longer submissions. In other cases, and they like to, honestly, they just like to do on-demand everything. So they're yeah. used to being able to binge stuff. Yeah. And so the, the other side of it is too, is a lot of people enjoy it at different times of the day and they're all in different places in their life some people download our stuff when they're on the train or the bus on the way to work others are reading it while they're doing laundry stuff like that to every kids and stuff. but if you enjoy it you just do it. and so it's i think what we've seen is that serialization of longer pieces get more attention online they're especially for the younger generations but I think that's probably the biggest thing I've seen is we've gone from larger pieces down to 1,250, 1,500 word submissions and people will read that and then look for the next as yeah. opposed to a four or 5,000 word chapter, which they may not start because they see it as too lengthy and they just they pass on it. So I think that's a big trend. I think that's not just us. I think it's market wide. Yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah, you're absolutely right that the attention span now is just so limited and it's across any kind of platform. I can see it with my channel on YouTube as well. So I think it's so so you have to adapt to make sure that you still have the engagement, but you connect with the way um, the listeners or the viewers are now, all the readers are now going to be focusing on it. So yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. So do you have an audio version of it as well, of the magazine, or it's just uh, written words? Written words at, at the moment, we do, do not have an audio version. We've been contemplating doing an audio version for our quarterly magazines, which come in PDF format. So we don't have physical copies. I think the days of that have passed us by. But people will download those PDFs. And I I'm a big proponent of finding various mediums through which you can publish your stuff. And for my own books, I have audio versions. So I think it's natural that we eventually get there as a magazine. There's a cost to that. And we need to find a few audio folks that might be willing to work with us uh, on that as a result, give back to the community and do this. And they're, our magazine lengths are not that long. They may only be... 60 or 70 pages on average, but you know, each story is, again, relatively small. Rarely do they go over 5,000 words. So the submissions there are stuff that an audio producer can get done and, and in a relatively short amount of time, yeah. even with post-production and push that back to us. So it's something we've been kicking around and it's something that I think you're right to point out, but we're just not there yet as a magazine. Okay. Okay. So what kind of advice would you give 
someone who is wanting to write and get a breakthrough with this genre of fantasy fantasy writing? Oh, there's plenty of advice to give. I guess I'll limit it to three or four pieces. The first thing is make sure that whatever you're writing is unique to you. Create your own world and don't be afraid of doing that because it's expected. You can't borrow someone else's unless it's fan fiction. And in a lot of cases, that's very difficult to do. And if you want to be your own and you've got a good story to tell, spend the time to build out that that realm because readers will expect that. They want something different. They want to see imaginative. And they also like to see epic things that you've thought through that might have a history to it or might have their own systems within, right? So I think that those are, that's part one. Part two, just as a writer, I would tell them to be open to constructive criticism. Uh, and when I say that in terms of, you mentioned this earlier, uh, it's really a team effort, right? Like my books are not nearly as good as they will be when they go through beta reading, when they go through my editors, when they go through my publisher, when they go through the final publications of it. At that point, it becomes really a team sport and a dozen people have looked at it and given it its blessing. And you've been able to use those pieces of constructive criticism to to dial it in, to make it tighter, to make it better. And so that that final manuscript that you send out is nowhere near final, right? It's going to get hammered three or four different times and you've got to fix it and then put it back out. And as long as you're open-minded to that, I think that's great. And the last piece of advice that I would offer is decide the, what kind of publisher you, or what kind of author you want to be. Do you want to be independent and be an indie author who's going to do your own stuff? and have control of your own destiny? Or are you going to try to find a more traditionally published way to do it? But if you're going to do that, understand that you're going to be forfeiting royalties and some level of of creative decision making on your products because your publisher is going to want input there. And so there's a give and take to both. I've seen value in both. I'm traditionally published, but I also have friends that are indies or a hybrid in between. And there's goods and bads to everyone, but that's something that you as an author uh, may want to decide once you've got a product that you're, you want to start to send out to agents and publishers to look at, or if you just know that you want to be independently published and you're just going to throw this on Amazon, make sure that you bring on the right people to help you format it and proofread it and all the editing that happens before you don't want to put something on Amazon without it touching two or three other people to let them see what you've got going on. So that's the advice I would pass along. Okay, thank you for that. And those who are listening, I'm sure it's very good, solid advice. So what for you has been the most surprising or let's say the most rewarding aspect of your journey as a fantasy author so far? I think that the most rewarding for me is the humbling experience that comes with someone coming up to you and asking you if for an autograph on your book or asking if they they hand you a piece of fan art that they've made that I always try to push out through social media or I put it on my website uh, to share with everybody else because in most cases, they're really good. They've taken the descriptions I've given and they've almost done a police sketch artist routine where they come and it's usually it's 90% of the way there. And they these people will pay to come to a con and they'll travel to that convention. They'll pay to get into that convention. They will find you and come up to you and tell you what they think. Or here's a piece of fan art. Does this look like the character that you've made? And those things are really truthfully humble uh, and most rewarding. And it gives you the energy as an author to write the next thing. Because as strange as this is going to sound, people think being an author is an easy job. It's, it's not. Creating a world and book and going through the process They think we just sit around at coffee shops and and write and all of a sudden we just publish it and make make money. There's so much more that goes into it than than that. And for someone to spend their own time, their free time to do something like that, I always try to reward this. I've got fan uh, requests for fan fiction. I've had the fan art submissions. I've had people come. I had one guy create a baseball card of he, he has a book of baseball cards that he creates of all of his favorite authors. Then he goes to find them and have them autograph their own card. And that was so (laughs) humbling for me. And I was like, I I thought he was just showing me his baseball card collection. And I was like, oh, well, that's cool. I'm a a sports fan. Let me see it. And he pulls it out. He's like, no, this is your card. I want you to sign it. And at that point, you're like, holy cow. Like, you've done that. 
And, and I think part of it is the kind of stuff I'm doing. This is what people do in their free time. They're, they're, they're looking for entertainment and they appreciate those free moments that they have. And when they do, they fall in love with characters or fall in love with a storyline or a plot line. They want to come out and find out what's next. And they want to give you advice and tell you what to do, what not to do, and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Too, but... yeah, because it seems like yeah. they are invested in your work and they really enjoy yeah. it and they want somehow to be a part of it. And if they're able to meet you and, and if they're able to talk about it or write to you or talk about it on their socials, I think that is, that's very, like you mentioned, humbling. And I can completely understand that. And I think it's, it's fascinating to see how you have been able to, from a life of 20 years of doing something completely different, <laughs> the way you have completely done a 360 and, and what you're doing today and how you are helping others to get into the fantasy world sometimes is also like forgetting reality right and and the fact that people are able to engage with your books and your magazine and and eventually it's going to be your virtual uh, reality and augmented reality stuff I think I think it's, it's incredible and with technology and AI getting to where it is today there'll be a lot more that you will be able to do as you go along and as the technology and uh, gets more and more evolved so I think it's amazing and personally I may not be a big fan but after having listened to you I probably will uh, pick up a couple of your books or at least get onto you, your magazine and and try and understand a little more it's been amazing talking to you Joe thank you so much I, I it's really been my pleasure hated this conversation thank you and I hope you get your network back quickly and thank you able to get i know but it's been wonderful talking to you thank you you have a great day same to you thanks for having me on i appreciate it thank you you take care for more weekly conversations do listen to melting pot on spotify apple and google podcasts follow us on youtube and on instagram at podcast melting pot so until the next episode this is pile signing off